storyteller tonight is the founder of Rural Vermont, um, and I'm very pleased to welcome him to the stage, Senator Anthony Polina. Well, first of all, 30 years seems like a long, long time, and the stories that I'm going to mention are probably going to seem a little bit like ancient history to a lot of us, but they are true, I guarantee you that. One of the things I would mention at first is that for those of us who think nothing good ever comes from political campaigns, what you don't know is that rural Vermont is actually the result of a campaign promise that was made in the campaign for the U.S. Congress, where my, my good friend Chris Wood and a few others worked very hard made some promises to the public, and when the campaign was over, decided to put some of them into practice. And what people may not know is that rural Vermont started as a service. It was a hotline for farmers. We took calls and gave farmers all kinds of advice as best we could and advocated for farmers on an individual and community level. We got a lot of calls at one point around property taxes. Without getting into the gritty details, there was a statewide reappraisal, and Farmers' taxes went through the roof, and we went around talking to farmers and working with them to help them uh, challenge their appraisals and lower their taxes again. Started doing it in groups because it was happening to everybody. And at one point, we arranged to meet with the farmers in St. Albans. A farmer from St. Albans called up and said, I got this problem. My taxes went through the roof. We said, well, it probably happened to everybody in town, so why don't you bring your friends? So we went up to St. Albans, and every farmer at St. Albans town, every farmer in town showed up. And there were a lot of them in those days, and that's one of the differences that changes as these stories go on, is the number of active farmers actually decreased as our work, as our work increased. But every farmer in town was there, and we were helping them try to redo their appraisals. And at one point, I looked at them, and I said, you know, this is crazy. We're not supposed to be helping people in crisis. We're supposed to avoid crisis said, you know, you guys got to work hard to change the policy that's driving you out of business and driving your taxes up. And this one farmer was there who was the chair of the board of selectmen, and he looked at me and he said, you know, Mr. Polina, which blew me away to begin with anyway, since it was 30 years ago, and I was not really that old at that point. <laughs> he said, you know, Mr. Polina, the problem is nobody in Montpelier listens to us anymore. And that just really hit me really hard, because my first thought was, if they're not listening to you, who are they listening to? I mean, you folks are the heart and soul of Vermont. So being a good advocate, the challenge in hearing that nobody was listening to them made us want to work harder to make sure people did listen to them. So we started bringing them into Montpelier, and we had them meet with the governor's staff and all these really smart people who were just astounded by the fact that they didn't know what these farmers were talking about because the farmers were talking from their hearts about what was important to them and their businesses and their lives. And when those meetings were over, those farmers felt more empowered than you can imagine. And so they said, here's what we want to do. We want to demand public hearings from the legislature about what's happening to us. So we went to the State House and we talked to some senators and House members. We said, you know, you got to hold some public hearings about what's going on with the farmers. And they looked at me, one of them at the time was Peter Welch, who was a state senator, and him and some others looked at me and they said, well, you know, we don't really think we can make that happen. We don't have the time or whatever it might be. So the farmers looked at them and said, okay, tell you what, we're going to organize hearings, and you're welcome to come and listen to what we have to say. <laughs> and within about 10 minutes, a group of state senators and state representatives said, you know what, we're going to hold some hearings, and we're going to go around the state, and we're going to listen to what farmers have to say. So again, to make a long story short, those farmers won that battle, and Andrea mentioned before that the current use program and how it's now part of Vermont's you know, way of life in a sense. At, the, at that point, was not, there, were ver, there were very few, if any, farmers who were enrolled in the current use program because of the way it operated. And since then, it's opened up to a lot of farmers, and it was rural Vermont that really won that victory for farmers and, and made that change. Then the farmers decided, that what they wanted to do was take on the idea of milk prices. And I'm not going to bore you with everything about the ups and downs of milk prices, but they were down a lot. And all I want you to do is imagine for a minute a group of Vermont dairy farmers dumping milk, dumping milk in the winter and right in the middle of the forest, dumping milk off their farms, being incredibly militant and really standing up for the fact that 
they were essentially getting screwed by the government that was convincing people that there was too much milk. And we always said, how could you have too much milk or too much food when you got millions of kids going to bed hungry? And the farmers said, that just can't be. So they went as far as actually dumping milk on the state house lawn. They drove a milk truck up that sidewalk and up that walkway towards the state house. Two milk trucks stopped, got out, and dumped milk around the trees. They were very polite about it. <laughs> but they dumped it on trees on the state house lawn. And what that resulted in, it was much, the struggle was much longer than that, of course. And it actually included a tractor cade. Up in North Troy at the time, there was, a, I think it was a Kraft cheese plant. And one day we went up there, uh, I, they obviously lived there, but I went up there with, and actually I was in a truck, uh, not a truck, a van, with Bernie Sanders and Bobby Starr. And this was before Bernie got elected, probably, or about the time he did. And we were saying, well, these farmers are going to do a protest, they're going to do a tractor cade. And, you know, we're driving up there and we're like, well, let's see if this happens, you know, this is pretty much to ask. And we got there and we looked down the road and there were just dozens and dozens and dozens of tractors coming from every direction and they had arranged it so that they would all converge on this one intersection in North Troy and they just kept circling, circling this craft cheese plant in North Troy demanding that the plant start treating them, the, paying them a fair price for their milk. In terms of the, what they were struggling with at the time, well, and it's, it's a little different now, policies have changed but the attitude is the same. The government was convinced that there was too much milk in America. So every time farmers produced a certain amount of milk, they got punished by being paid a lower price. So when the price went down, what did you do? You made more milk. The government said, now you made more milk. Price goes down. So price goes down. What do you do? You make more milk. And that kept going on and on. The odd thing at the time also, what the government did was they distributed free dairy products to low-income people, mostly in the form of blocks of cheese, but there was other things as well. And one of our dairy farmers by the name of Mary Judd, a really sweet old woman, probably about this tall, really feisty, her and her husband Bob operated a farm in Troy. And one of the other things they did, in, in addition to being good activist farmers, is they were a distribution point for surplus dairy products. So I get this, on this farm, once a week or whatever it would be, farmers, as well as others, but a lot of farmers from the area would stand on line for surplus food from the government. It's farmers standing on line to get surplus food, including blocks of surplus cheese. So at one point I had a conversation with a group of, well, not a group, but a couple of advisors to a well-known U.S. senator. One of them was in charge of dairy policy, the other one was in charge of food policy. And I said, okay, Janet, you're telling me there's too much milk and you're driving down the farmer's prices. And you, Ed, you're telling me you're running out of surplus products. I said, where is the surplus, Janet? Let's go see it. At the time, everybody was told that the surplus cheese was all held under, I think it was Kansas City, Kansas. And I said, well, let's just go get it if, it's a, you, know, if you need it to give it to low-income people because they had announced they were no longer going to give cheese to low-income people because there was a shortage the day after, no exaggeration, the day after they announced that they were going to lower farmers' prices 50 cents because of a surplus, they announced they were no longer, no longer going to distribute cheese to low-income people because there was a shortage of those products. So Mary Judd, who was a distribution point for farmers in her area, well, people in her area, came to the state house and stood on the lawn with the last block of surplus cheese to go through the state of Vermont. And she talked to the media and she said, you know, she explained how I'm a farmer. I'm a dairy farmer. They tell me I'm making too much milk. You can't have too much milk or any food product when there's millions of kids going to bed hungry. And yet now they're telling me there's no more, milk, no more cheese to be distributed. This is the last block of so-called surplus cheese to go through the state of Vermont. So like dumping milk and like standing up to the governor's staff and like demanding hearings from the legislators, those farmers showed incredibly great courage in doing that. One other thing I want to mention, which is in some ways was uh, an important lesson that I relate as much as possible, and I really think we, none of us should ever forget this. At one point, a group of us went to Washington, D.C., and it was me and a group of dairy farmers and others, and we got a meeting with the United States Senate Agriculture Committee. So we walk into this room, and it's nice and ornate, and they think the farmers will be intimidated and whatnot, and, 
We're sitting down talking around this big table to the United States Senators. And that year, this is back in the 80s, that year the American Bankers Association had said that in America we were losing a farm every four minutes. So you sit at the table with these senators, and I looked across the table and I said, you know, senators, Bankers Association estimates we're losing a farm every four minutes in America. This is a problem. We've got to do something about this. And one of the United States senators, in his great wisdom, leaned over the table and he looked at me and he said, you're wrong, Mr. Polina. The fact is, the policy is working just fine. We just have to let it run its course. So you sit there and you think about that. These smart guys who are in charge of policy telling you farm going out of business every four minutes and the policy was working. So you fly back home and you think about it a lot and not too long after that I happened to be in the library at the Vermont Law School and I was looking at some documents and I stumbled upon one by the Committee on Economic Development, which is a think tank made up of mostly corporate interests, not just food companies but all kinds of corporate interests. And they put out in 1960 a document called An Adaptive Approach for Agriculture. And they decided as corporate interests that there was a problem with American agriculture. And they put in black and white, they said the problem is there's too many farmers. Agriculture was inefficient because there was too many farmers. They had laid out this whole scheme and they said at the, near the end, they said, we have some choices. And that's important to remember. They said, we have choices. They said one of the choices is to control farm production, you know, make it so that farmers don't overproduce, what not. not that you can ever overproduce food, but that's the story that we can continue to have. They said one choice is to control production. They said, but the other choice is the one that we are recommending here, which is to induce excess resources, primarily people, to move rapidly out of agriculture because they thought that that was the best way to make agriculture more efficient. And you know the story, you'd rather pick up milk, you could pick up milk from 10 or 20 farms, it takes a lot of energy. To pick up all the milk from one farm, it's more efficient if you're a corporation, it's not, they don't, it's how they measure efficiency. But they said what they were recommending was a program to induce excess resources, primarily people, to move rapidly out of agriculture. And then they, can, then they basically laid out a plan as to how to do that by forcing farmers to take lower and lower prices until it became inefficient to allocate any more resources to, agri to, to, to farming. My point in this story is that no matter how hard the farmers worked and continue to work, and no matter how active they are and how right they are, what they were up against was a policy that said farmers are not useful anymore and agriculture should involve fewer farmers. But what's key about it is they said, the choices before us are A, pretty good, B, really bad. We're choosing B. And the lesson is it's about choices that are made by us or by policymakers that make choices supposedly on our behalf. And it's organizations like Rural Vermont that guarantee and continue to guarantee that we make better choices in the future, just like we've been doing up until now. So keep that lesson in mind. Thank you very much.